This is Mike Fitz, your resident naturalist with explore.org, the world's largest live nature cam network. And if you live in temperate areas of North America right now, you may have noticed that birds are quite busy. They're migrating, establishing breeding territories, trying to attract mates, and beginning to nest and raise their young. Some birds are in a contest to secure mates where they must demonstrate their fitness and worthy, worthiness to sire offspring. In fact, on their strutting grounds right now, each spring, sage grouse undergo a competitive battle for the opportunity to reproduce. And this is something that we can watch on Explore.org's newest live cam, the sage grouse lek cam. And to explore this topic, I'm joined by Dr. Pat Dibert, sagebrush science ecologist, uh, or excuse me, sagebrush ecosystem science coordinator and a wildlife biologist with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, so I'm uh, glad that she's able to, to join us today because she's one of the world's four, uh, foremost experts on sage grouse. So, um, so Pat, thanks for, uh, for joining me today on Explore.org. Happy to be here. If you have uh, questions for Pat about sage grouse, uh, you can drop those into uh, the comments on Explore.org if you're watching on the live chat channel right now. If you're watching somewhere else, like on Facebook Live, for instance, you can drop those comments right into there uh, as, as well. And at the end of our, our conversation here, we'll do our best to try to answer those questions for you. But uh, Pat, I, I would like to know a little bit about, uh, about you, just to give our, our audience uh, some understanding of, of how you came to study sage grouse. You've been involved, I think, in, in researching, researching them for uh, a few decades now. So how did you get involved yeah. in their study and, and how long have you studied them? I've been working in sage, with sage grouse and sagebrush for over 30 years. Um, started actually in a graduate school program um, a long time ago um, at the University of Wyoming where I did complete my PhD and have the sagebrush became ingrained as a part of who I am and have never been able to leave. It's an amazing ecosystem and sage grouse were my introduction into it. Um, they're a pretty incredible bird. Yeah, I, I think uh, many of the, the scientists and biologists that I've talked to over over the years, they, they they end up researching a subject and it they develop a very strong sense of place uh, or in connection with that. Uh, so that's something that I feel for uh, many of the national parks that I've worked in and a lot of the ecosystems that I've, that I've been in. And I'm learning a lot about sage grouse. I don't know too much about them, but they're, they're a kind of a fascinating bird, but they're one that a lot of people might not be necessarily uh, familiar with. And we're when, you, when we're watching the sage grouse on explore.org, uh, it's sometimes even difficult to get a sense of the scale of the, the size of the bird overall. Uh, they're not as big as a turkey, but they're not a small bird either. So you can tell us a little bit about their overall size and maybe what birds they might be related to? Sure, you bet. Um, sage grouse, weight-wise, the males are bigger than females and they run anywhere up four to five pounds for the males. That would be a very big male, a five pounder. Um, hens tend to be a little smaller, two to three pounds. They're this, uh, a good sized chicken. You're right. They're not quite as big as a turkey. They're not quite as big as a goose. They're not as tall as a goose, um, but they are bigger than a duck, if that helps. Um, males are larger. It's easy to tell them apart by size and by feather coloration, um, particularly this time of year where males are very puffed up and, and trying to impress the females. So there is a, a definite size difference. The picture there is a, actually a juvenile male sage grouse, um, but you can see the white ruff around the neck um, and the black feathers that come out of the, they look like they're coming out of the back of that white collar. They're actually at the base of the neck and those are called phyllo plumes. Um, and they're very fancy and pretty when you see the bird live. Um, apparently the females like them. And these birds, uh are obligates to a certain habitat. They need uh, a certain habitat, and that's uh, that's sage sagebrush uh, plains. Yes. So can you describe you know their overall habitat? You bet. Sagebrush is they cannot survive without sagebrush. Um, particularly in the winter, that is all they eat. And sagebrush also provides cover for them during the winter. Um, they will burrow down the snow if there is deep snow, but without that sagebrush structure, the birds will not survive. It is 100% their food. Um, 
In the spring, they will shift to include insects and then what we call forbs, so those little green plants that are not grasses. The hens need that, especially because they're, they're building up the resources to lay their clutch. And the chicks are really dependent on insects and, and grasses. So you'll find them in wet areas, uh, particularly as summer goes on. Um, they'll concentrate in, in uh, creek beds, uh, around wet meadows. You'll find them around uh, stock tanks in some cases, if, if there's vegetation around, because that's where the food and, and the insects are. But by the end of fall, they have switched back entirely to sagebrush. Um, sagebrush typically provides all their cover for nesting. They will nest under other things, but sagebrush is, is pretty dominant um, for a selection there. And they don't venture far from sagebrush. So they are truly a sagebrush obligate. And they also need very large landscapes to persist, sagebrush landscapes, um, because they do move around depending on where the food resources are during the year. This is something we might touch on uh, towards the end of the chat too, but sagebrush for a long, or, or excuse me, uh, yeah, sagebrush for a long time was considered sort of a, a wasteland. It didn't have a lot of ecological importance. Um, so, but we know now that's not necessarily the case. It is a very rich ecosystem and one that these birds are entirely dependent on, uh, like you said. Uh, formerly though, uh, ornithologists used to just consider sage grouse in North America to be one species, but recently they were fair, they were split up and now there's a different species that inhabits sort of like the, uh, the Colorado area or actually uh, to be more specific, the Southwest Colorado area. That's correct. Um, in 1990, the sage grouse was split into two, two species, uh, the greater sage grouse and the Gunnison sage grouse, named for the Gunnison area of Colorado where the largest population still occurs. Uh, Gunnison sage grouse are smaller. Um, they have a very different behavioral activity on the lek. Um, it's, it's, and they have, there are some physical distinctions between um, Gunnison sage grouse and greater sage grouse. And it's kind of, it, it's kind of amazing that we lumped them together for as long as we did just based on physical appearance. Um, Gunnison sage grouse occur in eight separate populations in southwestern Colorado, and there's one that extends into southern Utah. Um, and those birds are currently listed as a threatened species because their populations are very isolated um, and, and there's not a whole lot of, of movement between them. So now that we know a little bit about the bird, um, we should talk about the behavior because it is quite fascinating to watch. I've been tuning in. I, I'm not much of a morning person, but when I do get up, I try to tune in to the sage grouse cam on, Ex on Explore in the past few days. And I've been seeing several birds displaying uh, and it, it's a pretty intense competition. So they're on a, a display area called a lek. Uh, and, and Pat, can you describe what a lek is and maybe what sort of behavior we can expect to see from these birds on it? So a lek is a typically an open area somewhere in the sagebrush. And you know, males will come to this area year after year after year and display there. And we think that leks are formed in areas near where hens find good nesting habitat. But they want to be in open areas. And it can be sometimes a road, um, the airport runway in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Uh, birds will strut there. You can actually catch a lek on one of the Utah highway um, cameras because birds are using the edge of a highway. And then what it is is an open area, and oh, wow. that's important. Yeah, so the hens can see the males, but it's also important for acoustics. So the male will uh, puff up these air sacs. They're called guler sacs, and they're actually off of the stomach. They're not off of the lungs. And so they swallow this air into their stomach and inflate these sacs, and they brush their wings up against what we call the ruff, the white feathers around the neck. They're very short, they're very stiff. Um, they're not at all soft to the touch. And they will rough their wings up against that, make a swishing sound. And then they will inflate those sacs two or three times. And as the air escapes, it makes a popping sound. And then when they are done, there's this little whistle that they make as the, as the air escapes out of their stomach and back out their, their beak. Um, it's a very ritualized performance. Um, males will strut sometimes. They strut more when females are present, um, but they still strut at each other who's boss, so to speak. Um, it's, it seems that females like males who strut more 
and have a more robust strut rate. We really don't know all the ins and outs of why they select who they select to breed with. Um, but strutting is definitely, that behavior is definitely important. And the acoustics is really important. And if you're out on the sagebrush landscape early in the morning and there's no wind, often you can hear lex from a half mile to a mile away. So it's not a loud sound they make, but it is a sound that carries. I, I sort of uh, compare it to, you know, a lot of people may have seen footage of birds of paradise, like on planet earth or something like that, where they'll get together in the, tr in the trees and they'll do these elaborate display rituals to try to attract uh, a female. And this is maybe a North American version of that. It is, it is quite fascinating uh, to, to watch. And females are really sort of driving uh, this behavior by the males. Yes. Uh, and do they have a, when, when this happens, are they, uh, are the males displaying uh, or establishing a hierarchy or a pecking order on the lek? Are there more dominant males than others? And is that based on uh, who can strut the best? There is a, a definitely a hierarchy on the lek. And at first we thought it was based on a central territory. Um, it's probably a behavioral thing and whatever the mass, the male who has the best behavior, um, is who the females choose and then the other males come around him. So, it, you know, they may not have been selecting the middle of the lek for their territory, but they do select an obvious place. We do think it's behavior. No one's been a hen sage grouse, so we're not quite sure what they're picking up on. Um, we also think that there may be some copying behavior going on. The interesting thing about sage grouse is you will have one, maybe two males on a lek who secure all the copulations with the hens. And the other males do their best to try to impress, but females typically just walk by and head to that, that primary breeder on the lek itself. Um, we don't know. We don't know exactly what the drivers are. Um, a lot of my research entailed looking at, is there something physical that the hen was, was being attracted to and we could find nothing that seemed to be an attractant to her. Um, but the behavior, the strutting intensity and how frequently they strut did seem to be important. And perhaps that is a way for the hen to assess the male's physical condition to see what kind of quality of sperm he's going to give her for her offspring. Um, there is no interaction between the male and the female after the let. The female will go off. So she's looking strictly for the quality of sperm. Um, probably not thinking that, but that's the way we scientists have, have been assessing it. Females also seem to have a hierarchy on the lek as well. And this is something that's brand new. Um, they squabble amongst each other and a lot of noise on the lek. If it's very quiet and you're listening, you can actually hear the hens kind of fight amongst themselves um, over who's going to get to be with the male first. Um, and it's actually kind of a fascinating culture that we're still just now learning and, and exploring to try to understand hen dominance um, and who gets to be the top hen along with the, with the top male there. It's a fascinating system. And is the hen, now that you mentioned it, or is that sort of like uh, interactions between the hens visible on, on the lek, or is it something that happens more sort of out of sight in the sagebrush and something that you might be able to hear if you have, uh, you know, if you have the opportunity? Most of it's on the lek um, because they are competing for a male. Okay. Um, and off the lek, there's very few. At that point, they disperse to go back to their nest site, which is selected before they come to the lek for breeding. Um, and at that point, they typically don't do a lot of interaction. Simply as a safety feature. Um, a lot of noise or a lot of movement in sagebrush can attract predators to an area. And so they, they tend to disperse and be kind of loners. They will group up again once they have broods. Um, and primarily because they're sharing common resources. But while they're on the nest, they are solitary. So the, the pecking order for hens happens on the lek as, as well as the males. Yeah, as, I've, as I've, I've said uh, regarding other animals in the past, if they could only take surveys for us, it would make our research a lot easier. So it'd be, it'd be wonderful to know what sort of, yeah. Yeah, what sort of features the, you know, the birds are are, are selecting for those females, um, but it may remain a mystery for a long, long time. It doesn't mean uh, it's not a fascinating yeah. sub subject to to uh, investigate, yeah. however. Uh, I often said I wanted so to we be a hen sage just for one day. <laughs> and th this time of the year is uh, for, for some 
some areas where sage grouse are displaying right now. I think the, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's a bit of the tail end of their lecking season. Um, so maybe if you could, for the audience, just describe um, when the best time of the day to watch the uh, sage grouse and the time of the year as well. Could you describe sort of like that, that spring cycle that they might go through? So sage grouse gather on Lex sometimes starting as early as February. Uh, definitely the males will start showing up on Lex to try to establish their dominance between them. Um, and you'll see them early on, both morning and evening at sunset um, on the Lex, kind of practicing their show and their display. Um, depending on where you are, and it depends on latitude and weather conditions, um, but mostly latitude, some of the lecking seasons start very early and like you said, are probably starting to wind down in more of the southern reaches of the, of the bird's distribution. We are currently, I would say probably at peak lecking activity for much of the mid-range of the greater sage grouse right now. Um, and the northern ranges may lack a little behind us. It really does depend on um, how harsh the winter is. Um, it depends on um, whether or not hens are coming early or late to the lek, but you want to go out and see a lek. Sometime between March and April are going to be your best dates. Some of the leks may persist um, activity-wise until mid to late May. Typically at that point, we have juvenile males who are practicing more for next year because being on a lek is incredibly energy intensive for males. They're out there displaying. Um, they get exhausted. They if they're successful at breeding, they last until about the end of April, and then they have to go off to um, recover, so to speak, energetically. And that's when you get juvenile males. But the juvenile males still provide an excellent um, opportunity to observe the behavior of these birds. Um, you need to be on a lek before sunrise. So for folks who are not morning people, it can be a tough call. Um, but that is so you are in place before the birds really get active. We don't want to disturb their breeding activity. They only have a few months to accomplish this very important activity so that they can produce the next generation. Um, and you want to sit, if you can, be as far, you know, up to 800 yards away. Do not get out of your vehicle um, unless you are willing to crawl on your belly in the middle of the night to hide behind sagebrush to watch these birds. Vehicles provide excellent blinds. The sage grouse don't seem to recognize them as a threat. Um, but you want to you want to make sure you get there before you disturb the birds. And if you're observing on private land, you want to be respectful of the landowner as well. But that's the time to go see them. And I strongly encourage folks to get out and see them in person. Um, enjoy the let cam. And if you get a chance, also go see them in person. Yeah, and the the camera that is on Explore.org is located in Oregon. Uh, so this seems like it would be a pretty good time to continue to watch that. And I've, I've been, when I've, when I've been watching it, I've noticed, uh, three birds that seem to come to the same spot almost every day. Would you say those are, yeah, I don't know if you've had the opportunity to watch or not, and it's very difficult to identify individuals amongst the species. Uh, but could you speculate maybe a little bit on whether or not those are the same individual birds returning to that exact same spot on the lek each day? I would assume that they are. Because again, okay. they do is kind of establish their pecking hierarchy on the lek, um, and they do come back to the same general area every single day. And if you watch, you'll you'll get to see them fight each other if one gets too close to another one's territory. And um, those can be fairly ugly fights that they can do a lot of damage to each other during those fights. Um, but it's all to keep the attention of the female on them and not on the adjacent male. Yeah, the amount of endurance that these birds must have to dance like that um, for hours each day uh, for a few months is is really incredible. I, th I think if anyone's ever <laughs> tried, you know, online dating or just going to a bar to try to find, uh, you know, <laughs> to try to try to find yeah. a partner, it, you know, it's, it's probably not nearly as exhausting as it is to be a sage grouse. So in some ways, humans have it have it easier than than a lot of these species. <laughs> The, uh, the males actually, actually all the birds tend to gain weight during the winter on the diet of sagebrush. But by the end of the lecking season, the males will have lost significant weight and are in pretty tough shape. Um, and that's, they, they kind of go off and try to replenish after a very exhausting uh, lecking season. So you're absolutely right. It's, it's a tough haul, but this is their one shot for the entire year. So they're going to do what they can to impress the ladies. 
And could they be uh, more vulnerable to predation during that time? I mean, I can imagine, you know, having all of your fat reserves and energy reserves exhausted during this, this lecking season, you may be more vulnerable to something like a golden eagle or a coyote that is, uh, that happens to spy you. Yes, that's that's true. So leks tend to be historic. They tend to be in the same place year after year after year. And some of the leks that I've had the privilege of working on have been in place that we know of for over 100 years, the location wow. of them. So the predators learn that. They, they also have figured out that these birds gather here in the spring um, and they will often search leks for um, the opportunity to get a breakfast that day. Um, Sage grouse are pretty wary, and a lot of times they will see the predator long before you have any idea it's there. I, many a morning where the birds just drop, and they're very well camouflaged, so when they drop, the, the white is hidden, um, and the hens are very cryptic. They're very hard to see even when they're up and active. Um, and typically the predation events that I have seen on Lex is when the birds just fail to spot the predator, um, such as a golden eagle diving from 100 feet. Um, a lot of times, and, and this may happen on the leg cam as well, um, you might turn tune in and the birds are gone very, very early in the morning. And that could be because a predator has already flown over the leg or we've had a coyote move through the leg. Um, we often see coyotes on the Oregon leg cam. Um, so the birds have left for the day um, knowing that their chances are better tomorrow when they're not being hunted by something that is looking for a good meal for the day. So yes, predation can be an issue on the lek, um, but clearly it's not strong enough to keep these birds from coming out and trying to get things done in the early spring. And if a predator does come by, is, that's it for the day then? It's, uh, they're just like, ah, this is, this is uh, too risky and uh, I'm gonna go back out into the sagebrush where I can hide and feed and maybe come back and try again tomorrow? For the hens, that's usually true. For the males, okay. it kind of depends on how um, intense the predation risk was. For example, a lek that I was observing last week, a harrier flew over. A sage grouse is a big prey item for a northern harrier, and the sage grouse dropped, but they seemed to realize that a harrier is probably not a significant threat, and they got back up and continued displaying. Um, but for the hens, if it's a big predator coming by or a big risk, they're going to go into the sagebrush because they don't want to risk it. Um, males are, seem to be a little preoccupied and they tend to persist to stick it out a little bit longer. Mm. And that's one thing I like about watching birds is they notice things because they're often a prey species, you know, things like to eat them. They often notice yes. things before I do. I'm not nearly as uh, observant or aware, as wary as, uh, as a bird. So this will be something that I'll be looking for, uh, you know, tomorrow morning when I tune into this to the sage grouse cam. If I see the birds, yeah, hunker down like that, then maybe I'll be uh, more more likely to see one of those predators, like a like a coyote or or a golden eagle. And that's something that you can do when you walk around in the forest as well. You know, all of a sudden, if you learn the the alarm the alarm calls of birds and you hear them. And that's an opportunity for you to really start to pay attention and look around. There could be a, like a, a bobcat or a house cat or, you know, a coyote or something in the forest that's that's a potential predator of this bird. So fascinating to, to think about and something definitely to watch for uh, on, yes. on the cams. So, you know, it's it's a challenge for these birds to... To, um, to, to secure mates. I mean, they have to compete. They have to have a lot of endurance to do it. Uh, but sage grouse face, uh, unfortunately, challenges that are imposed on them uh, by people. And it's not necessarily bird watchers going to watch uh, sage grouse. It's right. actually probably from a variety of other factors. So um, maybe it's sort of to introduce uh, and, and start to discuss their, their conservation status, we could uh, if you could uh, just talk about the historic trends in their populations over time, because right now sage grouse are much less abundant than they were just, uh, you know, 100, 150 years ago. That's absolutely correct. Um, sage grouse like really undisturbed landscapes. Um, they're very tolerant of us on their lack as long as we are respectful of their space, but they don't like um, human development. Um, they roads that are punched in, even though they will use them sometimes for lecking and for travel. Um, typically roads bring in other activities that then disturb the birds. Um, sage grouse 
we, we have no idea how many there were because no one was counting them two or 300 years ago. But we have been tracking actually the state wildlife agencies have been tracking them since the early 1960s and those, those counts became very consistent in the mid 1980s. And since then we've declined um, a, fairly significantly in the number of birds that we're seeing every single year on the WEX. Um, and states do work together to try to pull together a population trend. They're cyclic. Uh, about every 10 years, they will trough down to the bottom and then they'll climb back up. Not quite sure what's driving that, although we do believe it's tied to weather patterns. Um, so, you know, a, a change from year to year in numbers probably doesn't mean a whole lot, but if you get a long-term change for 10 or 15 years, or if your numbers are dropping down and instead of turning back up after 10 years, they keep going down, then we need to start looking for what could could happen to them. So, you know, energy development is one example, um, and it gets picked on a lot. But primarily to go back to a statement you made, sage grouse has always been, or sage brush has always been considered the big empty. And so, and that's also where we have a lot of, of energy resources that can be developed. So we weren't, we didn't understand what we were doing um, because no one appreciated the complexity of that sagebrush ecosystem. But probably another big risk for sage grouse and other sagebrush ob obligate species like pronghorn, antelope, and some of the small birds, brewer, sparrow, sage thrasher, et cetera, um, is the increased fire frequency in sagebrush that's facilitated by invasive plant species. And, and the particular uh, evil plant uh, du jour is cheatgrass which is an exotic species that was introduced into the sagebrush ecosystem about 100 years ago, and it likes to serve soil. And as it gets established, it tends to outcompete our native um, forbs in the grasses, in the sagebrush ecosystem, and it loves fire. Um, it starts it's growing earlier. In fact, I was pulling some starts out of my garden just this last weekend. Um, gets started much earlier in the spring and it cures out and dries much earlier and then a fire, it supports a fire moving through. Fire kills sagebrush, it rarely regenerates. So you've lost your sagebrush, it's a lot of effort to get it back and then cheatgrass loves fire disturbance. So that cycle has been accelerating primarily because we have been punching more holes in the sagebrush for, for good reasons. Um, we weren't aware of the threat and the fact that cheatgrass feeds that fire cycle increases the frequency. We're starting to see a lot of habitat loss for greater sage grouse in particular, and particularly in the western part of the species range. So that's probably the, the primary threats that are facing it. Um, like I said, they just they they like big undisturbed landscapes. So anything that's going to punch a hole in that or change that for them is going to create a risk to the species. And cheatgrass, at least in my experience, isn't isn't pleasant for for much. You know, like you said, it's a non-native species in North America. Uh, cattle don't like to eat it. Uh, I the first time I ever experienced it, I was in California. It was like the first time I was in California, and I went hiking through some grass. I was like, oh, this is wonderful, and it just the the seeds destroyed my shoes. It got stuck in there. I couldn't wear the shoes anymore. Um, so it's yeah. it's it's a rough plant in a lot of ways. So it's not good for birds, not good for grazing animals. Um, so yeah, uh, like you said, there are many threats associated or uh, that that sage grouse are are dealing with right now. An invasive species habitat development is definitely a, a big one. Uh, so what role does uh, you know your organization, the the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, play in helping to conserve sage sage grouse in the wild? So the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service initially got involved with sage grouse, which is a state what we call a state trust resource. We don't manage it, it's not considered a migratory bird, so it's completely managed by the individual states. We got involved about 20 years ago when we received petitions to list the greater sage grouse under the Endangered Species Act. And we became very engaged with the state partners, we became very engaged with our federal land management partners to see what we could do to make sure that never happened. Um, we don't like listing species. And so that's what we were working towards for sage grouse. And so we worked with our state partners, we worked with our federal partners, um, both land management folks, as well as folks like NRCS, engaged private landowners, um, to try to see if we could do some conservation actions. Can we, can we design energy development in such a way that we minimize a footprint but still allow for the extraction of those resources? Um, can we work with private landowners to help them either with their management of their sagebrush, um, 
while still maintaining the productivity that keeps them on the landscape, keeps them from selling their ranches in divisions, which are never good for sage grouse. Um, and so we, we do a lot of that conservation action to try to help our partners. Um, a program that I sit in within Fish and Wildlife Service, we provide research to try to understand what's happening out there. And we provide funding for other research um, for other folks to understand that. So we're very much engaged with that, but recognize this is a group effort. This is a conservation partnership opportunity. We've made great strides um, and we have a lot of work ahead of us, but that's how we're engaged. We're not a regulatory agency on this particular species. We're also expanding to look at sagebrush to the community as a whole, because that's how we're going to be successful is if we focus on the entire ecosystem. Absolutely, it does take a community, I think, to conserve this species. And speaking of that, uh, what could uh, you know somebody who's watching at home do to help conserve uh, sage grouse in the wild? So you never want to be aware. Be aware of what the concerns are out there. Work with your local, state, Fish and Wildlife Agency to see how maybe you may be involved. A lot of times we need folks to go out and count leks because there are so many leks we simply can't get to them every year. Um, if you have fences. Um, you might want to mark them. Sage grouse can't see a wire um, in a, on a fence, and so they fly into them. We get some mortality there. Um, if you do happen to have the privilege of living out in sagebrush, keep your pets contained so that they aren't out harassing, particularly hens and chicks. But I think the biggest thing is is to really be aware of what the local conservation issues are in your area. If you can help. Um, mark fences, NRCS sometimes does these big fence marking days. If you can talk to um, your your legislatures to say, hey, I think this is an issue, how can I be involved? But contact your state wildlife agency and see how you can help volunteer there because they're the folks who are truly doing the on the ground counting and assessing of these birds and they always can use some help. And sage, sagebrush uh, habitat is not isolated habitat. I mean, it, it's, it covers, I think, I, I read a statistic, and correct me if I'm wrong, a path of, you know, the U.S., uh, what we would consider the, the Mountain West. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's there. If you live basically anywhere uh, near the Rocky Mountains or, uh, or to the west of the Rocky Mountains, there's probably going to be some sagebrush, or, you know, sagebrush habitat around for you to, he to help conserve. Uh, yes, so, sagebrush habitat. 13 different states and extends into Canada. So it's quite expansive. And we're coming up uh, on about a half hour. And I think that's all the time that we have uh, for for uh, Dr. Dibert to, to join us this afternoon. But I do want to thank her, Dr. Pat Dibert from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, for helping me learn and helping everybody at home learn about uh, sage grouse, uh, a species that shows a fascinating uh, lecking behavior, a display behavior each spring, and we can watch that right now um, on the Sage Grouse Lek Camp on Explore.org. And if you want to learn more about these birds, definitely check out the cam, but make sure that you also visit a few websites. Uh, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service has a great website, uh, fws.gov slash greater sage grouse that you can visit. You can go to uh, nature.org slash lek cam to, uh, to watch the sage grouse there as well. And they also have some great uh, resources on the Nature Conservancy website. Um, and you can also go to sage grouse, sage grouse initiative, uh, com, And there's a lot of really great uh, information on there as well. Uh, so Pat, thanks again uh, for joining me uh, today on Explore.org. And I'll be sure to tune in more this spring to watch these fascinating birds. Thank you very much. This is this has been a great pleasure. And get out to a lek if you can. It's a great experience. All right, will do. Thank you very much.